Martin Schmornitz and I will be the moderating this morning's session. I myself work at the Baltic Center for Media Excellence with the Eastern Partnership countries. So I'm in a bit based in Riga, but with one leg and one hand in the region. Um, we will be having a little bit kind of the not an easy task today since the, the panel is or our session is about trying to find the policies or the approaches for the, what the international organizations and players could use to address very divergent and very challenging region. We see that the last couple of months have made this region even more divergent. Some of the frozen conflicts got frozen even deeper, probably. There's a political turmoil in Belarus at the moment. There are elections going on. So I think the next hour we will spend with um, very interesting and very provoking uh, debates. And then let me first of all a little bit tell you about how we proceed. At the beginning, we all four of our speakers will have like five minutes each of them for interventions on the topic. Afterwards, based on what we talked, we have like a small discussion and reflections among the speakers and, and me. And then approximately half of our session will be devoted to your questions, to your reflections, and, and to make it more as interactive as possible under the uh, online circumstances. And then let's start those interventions. And um, before I give the floor to Pavel Luzin, I would like briefly introduce you to him and tell that Pavel is currently um, actively contributing to such uh, media platforms as Riddle and Jamestown Foundation and is also uh, very often writing for the Moscow Times and Vedimosti, the two media outlets based in Russia. And before Pavel has a long, uh, long, long experience uh, working in Russia with security defense issues, being a part of the team of Alexei Navalny, um, also as a fellow at the Institute of World Economics and International Relations in Moscow, and then teaching at the Perm University and also higher school of economics in, uh, in, in, in Russia. So, um, dear Pavel, please, the floor is yours. So, uh, towards our topic, uh, first of all, we need to analyze the uh, crucial conditions of uh, our current reality. Uh, first of all, because I am Russian and uh, I would like to speak mostly about my country. Uh, first of all, uh, it is a turbulence around Russia's borders that has been created as by Russia since 2008-2014, annexation of Crimea and the de facto annexation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, de facto uh, annexation of uh, Donbass, uh, not the Euro. Uh, so this turbulence was created by Russia. Also turbulence that has been created recently by Turkey in Karabakh as by objective political and economic processes, for instance, in Belarus. Uh, the second crucial condition is Russian domestic political uncertainty. Because new constitution, uh, institutions of power that were paralyzed by pandemic, uh, and uh, Kremlin is trying to restart the political system uh, of Russia in this reality, pandemic reality and new constitutional reality. Uh, and also economic crisis uh, that is influencing on political system of Russia. And uh, despite the current political surrender in Karabakh and because of the political surrender in Karabakh, Kremlin will need to improve its foreign status, especially towards its neighborhood, uh, in aim to balance domestic 
political system. So uh, that is the main challenge for Eastern neighborhood at all for coming decade, at least for coming decade. So in face of uh, this long-term uncertainty and unpredictability of Russia, the NATO should improve its solidarity among NATO allies, uh, especially in face of issue of Turkey and in face of political and economic troubles uh, among the European allies after th this pandemic, after the economic crisis that was stimulated by uh, pandemic uh, and so on. Uh, in its turn, the European Union or some EU members should revise and promote the model of prosperity. And Europe, the European Union should start to talk in the language of values when it discuss uh, the future of Eastern neighborhood. Because um, currently the former technocratic approach doesn't work. Especially uh, we can see this during this pandemic crisis. Technocratic approach doesn't work. Europeans have to speak in a uh, language of values with Eastern neighborhood, with Russia and uh, with themselves, it seems. So it seems five minutes of, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finished. for your thoughts um, we'll go we'll go to our next speaker who is Dimitri Terepik this morning with us and who is currently the chief executive at the International Center for Defense and Security based in Tallinn in, in Estonia and as you may know that center is the leading the think tank in Estonia and in the regionally I would say when it comes to the foreign and security issues and is also the main player when it comes to setting up and, and organizing the annual Lennart Meri conference. Before that, uh, Dmitry used to have like a different post uh, with the Ministry of Defense in Estonia and mostly focusing on the security risks and researching those security risks and the risks which includes also caused by the hostile disinformation societal polarization, ideologies, and, and many other. Um, Dmitry, please share, us, share with us your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Martin, and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, I must admit that uh, my experience uh, with the East partnership is very much limited with uh, Ukraine. We are working where uh, almost uh, six years from now and with also some insights from uh, Georgia and, uh, and Moldova. And I like very much uh, the idea of, uh, of Pavel uh, not addressing uh, so-called technocratic issues. And so I'm not going to tell about, let's say, policies related uh, to financial aid from European Union uh, to, to other countries. And I do understand uh, that uh, European approach uh, to those countries, uh, well, it is inevitable uh, to be focused on uh, macro level and on the various strategic reforms. But, uh, well, my experience is, of course, that uh, no size fits all. And uh, in my country, in Estonia, we, uh, we say that small can be beautiful. So therefore, I think uh, European Union uh, and other donor organizations should support more so-called grassroots initiatives locally and uh, regionally. And uh, for doing that, of course, uh, very practical steps should be planned. And I just uh, name briefly uh, four of them. Of course, uh, European Union uh, and European community in general uh, need uh, uh, 
uh, to apply a tailored approach to address very specific needs and uh, peculiar interest of various target groups in the in the regions. That means that we should have very uh, insightful situation awareness for uh, our evidence-based decision-making process about uh, uh, these needs. Uh, and that brings me to the second point uh, that we need uh, to engage fully and to ensure full involvement of uh, local and regional communities, uh, the uh, leaders and opinion leaders, obviously, uh, to work closely with the uh, different representatives of uh, various uh, audiences and, uh, and groups. And it's not just about infrastructure, it's not just about, let's say, good governance or whatever reforms, it's very much about set of values. And that's again, uh, brings me to the point uh, Pavel made. Uh, it's about uh, mentality, if you wish. It's about uh, perception of democracy in those countries uh, and uh, yeah, other uh, cognitive issues because mindset determines the actions. And if it's not a fully European man mindset, that I think our uh, cooperation won't be uh, successful. The third point I would like to highlight is, of course, uh, that uh, with this knowledge about these uh, audiences and their needs and uh, aspirations, uh, we can obviously involve them uh, very smartly uh, into a long-term professional exchange uh, with the other European partners. Well, I'm not talking about kind of, you know, uh, a regular university type uh, short term uh, study programs, uh, but I'm talking more about long term and result oriented exchange between uh, professionals, uh, experts and specialists um, in order to uh, train each other. And of course, in order to uh, learn from each other and uh, actually in order to reshape our own mutual perceptions. So, and the last uh, point uh, I would make uh, for the introduction is that uh, by all actions uh, supported by the European Union and targeted on the Eastern Partnership countries, we should cultivate and promote uh, their self-confidence. And I think uh, the experience of the Baltic states uh, might be very useful just to remind our own position in early 90s and how low our, our self-confidence was and <laughs> how high it is now. So yes, cultivating and promoting uh, self-confidence and the sense of belonging to Europe among various uh, societal groups in uh, these countries, not just among the political elite, uh, which is often the case, because uh, the sense of belonging to Europe and to this European set of values these are uh, driving forces for uh, uh, real changes uh, on the ground. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dmitry. Um, I already have on my paper several, let's say, the follow-up questions or the topics for our further discussion. We will be, I'll be happy to use them, but only after our next two speakers will do their introductions and as the next one, I am very happy to introduce you to, uh, to Alexei Grigoriev, who is a currently the vice chairman of the Baltic to Black Sea Alliance, which is a regional type of the organization with the working in the, in the countries of the Eastern Partnership, but with the seat in Riga. And Alex, I would say, is, I think, one of those very few individuals who have had a chance before while working at the National Democratic Institute to live in, all, in almost all Eastern Partnerships countries, except Armenia, and including also Russia on top of, the, top of it during his long career at the National Democratic Institute. Alex has been also active and is still active at the civil society level and even been elected to Latvian Parliament and Riga City Council earlier. So, Alex, I think uh, five minutes are yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure to uh, participate in such, uh, in such company. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, thank you, all the speakers. Um, um, 
the topic, I think, uh, the, of our today's discussion uh, will recur uh, many more times because uh, some time has passed and uh, the countries are indeed divergent. Uh, there is actually surprisingly little to unite them uh, except, uh, except the fact that uh, all six countries have been part of the Russian Soviet Empire some time ago, and that they are still the arena of Russian attempts to reconstitute, reconstitute that empire in one way or another. Um, uh, thank you, Pavel, for naming all those uh, territories that are occupied or de facto uh, um, uh, by Russia, you've forgotten one, uh, and that is Transnistria um, uh, or Pridnistrovia in Russian. Uh, so <clears throat> that is um, because uh, although it is not in Russia's neighborhood, uh, sort of uh, formally speaking, uh, is about more than a thousand kilometers away from Russia. Uh, it is. Uh, it has Russian troops on its territory. Uh, and its budget is uh, decided in Moscow and, and so on. So this, um, uh, this point is very important uh, that these, uh, in all of these territories, Russia is trying to reconstitute its power and its influence. We have uh, seen very, um, uh, very recently, uh, several days ago, and, and here again, I, um, I disagree with the fact, uh, with the idea that, uh, that Turkey is behind the, the war in, um, in uh, Karabakh, in, East, in Southern Caucasus. Um, uh, surprisingly, if you, if you look at the language of, um, of uh, Russia uh, towards the current <clears throat> government of Armenia, of the Russian leadership, and the Azerbaijani leadership, it is the same. It is. It, it's based on the same set of values and the same. Uh, they, they're talking about Sarasata, the sort of the sons or or the children of of Soros, um, uh, sort of being in power there. It's a way of sort of derogatory uh, speaking about the government of Armenia. And in that, Russian gov government and the Azerbaijani government are united. The result uh, of the war is uh, actually that, uh, that in Russia won in the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Something that uh, former leader of Azerbaijan, Heydar Aliyev, has always been um, strictly against. And that is uh, putting Russian uh, soldiers on the territory of uh, Azerbaijan will now happen. They have already arrived and they, uh, they are so-called peacekeepers. We know what this peacekeeping is all about. We've seen that in Georgia. We saw that in, in Moldova, in Transnistria. So, uh, so there will be peacekeepers. Uh, the, um, the corridor <clears throat> from Azerbaijan to, um, to the Nakhichevan Republic of Azerbaijan uh, is, uh, will be controlled by FSB, by the border guards of, of um, FSB. Uh, so um, uh, I, I also agree with one more, uh, Pavel, your, um, your uh, saying, and that is that we should really be based on the values, that, uh, that um, uh, not no realpolitik, but values. Uh, this is what, what the European Union at least should be about. And this is the language that we should be talking in, in this area. Um, um, so uh, a lot of what we'll have to do here, whether in the countries that are aspiring to become part of, this, of the European Union uh, uh, as soon as possible, or in the, in the uh, territories, countries that have not announced such wish, but, uh, but that will be uh, dealing with Russian em uh, efforts to reconstitute its empire. Thank you. I think, it, I think it's five minutes. 
You're perfect with timing. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and then I will give you a floor to Andis Kudors, but before that, let me also shortly tell about Andis and his um, experience and career. He is currently and for already a long time uh, teaching at the La University of Latvia at the Faculty of the Social Sciences and has a very long engagement at different roles and responsibilities with the Center for East European Studies which brings on this also in the area of the Eastern Partnership and Russia. And the previously on this uh, was very active and widely also at European level at uh, different civil society organizations, um, including the European Democratic Students Movement and others. Please, Andis. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for having me here. So I will continue with something what Alex finished, I mean, values and norms. And if we look to the European Union as an international player, international actor, we can say that one of the features of uh, for European foreign policy is normativity. And normative player and normative power means that both your aims and methods you are using to reach those aims or goals are normative. That means it's just naturally that European Union as a union of democratic countries wants to see in the neighborhood democratic countries countries with fundamental freedoms, with uh, free market, and uh, with respect to human rights. So, but if you look at this area, Eastern Partnership countries area, it's an area of competitiveness. I mean, it's, uh, I'm sorry, of competition. It's area of competition. There are other big players. And of course, first of all, it's Russia. And if we compare like normative player, which works in the with the rules of conditions, that means there are conditions. We will give you some financial support to Eastern Partnership countries if you will accomplish something in democratic transit, which is okay, which is good. But on the other hand, the other player like Russia is strategic player and it works without uh, conditions, the same like China does. That means European Union, uh, I mean, Russia, uh, doesn't care about ethical norms. It's not restricted in foreign policy also by, by norms of international law. What we saw in, in, uh, in Ukraine and Crimea, for example. So in, in that kind of com uh, competition, unfortunately, in short run, normative player is, is, is losing. And uh, in in long run, of course, this normativity is a strength of European Union, but in short and in mid term, it, it doesn't allow to, to be flexible. And as Pavel already said it about this te technocratic approach, I would also call it like bureaucratic approach, which we saw in Eastern partnership uh, policies. Of course, all that system with monitoring, uh, with the summits, uh, with reports, about success in, in uh, uh, democratic transit, it has to be stay there, but I like flexible approach. And there were, unfortunately, we can see that uh, there was some kind of strategic miscalculation done by so-called collective West. Idea towards uh, Russia many years has been to, to engage, to engage Russia. We saw recent policies, uh, and, for example, toward Belarus was EU policy was strictly normative. That means there are conditions. There is no real engagement. And I believe that that should be like just opposite with toward Russia. Collective West has to act in, in, in normative manner. That means we do not trust words. We only look to the deeds. And toward Eastern uh, partnership countries, it has to be more flexible. On the end of the day, we will reach those, our normative goals, which are good. I mean, definitely we want to see democratic Belarus, democratic uh, Azerbaijan and other countries. 
but how to how to get it uh, if the other competitor works without acts without uh, uh, any conditions i mean any uh, constraints so let's let's do it simple less bureaucracy more strategic approach russian propagandists used to say that eu came as a strategic player and want to control all those eastern neighboring um, eastern partnership countries actually it's just opposite russia acts as a strategic player with one hand they are supporting belarus with other hand they are taking something like bell trans gas for example many years ago so on the end of the day they are controlling something already without any kind of conditions so let's be flexible and and probably that will be a long way but then we can see uh, neighbors of EU as a prosperous, secure, and and happy. So thank you. Thank you, Andis. Um, I see that we are already having uh, questions coming in. I just want to say to our audience that they are taking note, and we will go back to them so nothing will be forgotten. But before we go to the audience questions, I would like to ask for the, our speakers. Do you want like to respond or to add to anything what, which was told before? Please, please just raise your hand and... and okay, if there's no at the moment, I would like a little bit to... To challenge, to challenge the several suggestions actually, which were, which were told today, and uh, one of them was about um, the value approach, which to which I under I mostly understood you all four share about this plus or the minus. Uh, could you each of you just a shortly say me what would you see as the e what EU and where NATO could specifically do when it is about this value approach? Bearing into the mind that the EU has the difficulties itself uh, following the, its own values as we see that the big conditionality discussions about the breaching some of the, the, the EU basic values. So that Please, could you have like some, some, some suggestions on this value avenue? Um, and then may I start this time from Andis? Of course. So, uh, when we think about like common foreign policy of EU and in NATO itself, it's, we have to remember there are many member states which has to agree among each other before the, there is some kind of action. On the other side, there is a one player, Russia, with a uh, decision-making pro process, uh, like fast decision-making process, like typically for authoritarian states. And uh, of course, we uh, NATO is also not just military alliance, it's an alliance of values as well, but it's only for those members who are already in. We remember what happened in, in Georgia when in 2008 we didn't give the map, I mean, membership action plan. And just after that, Russia came really fastly with a war in Georgia because the, the point of view from like Russian Kremlin perspective is is uh, is the military perspective of military strategy, and we can also use word geopolitics. That means they are always looking who is the who is controlling this. That the idea that small countries cannot uh, be really sovereign states. This is really popular in, uh, among people in Kremlin and and people in the Russian uh, defense. Uh, institutions. Uh, that means uh, that mean uh, if they can see that there is some kind of open space. For example, just after Barack Obama pronounced his strategies that the United States is turning to the 
to the specific area, uh, Pacific Ocean area, and in other places, and just left Central Europe as it is. So for Russia, that was green light. Ah, this is this free space we can we can go. Uh, I'm afraid that yeah, even if we if we want to promote values, we have to think strategically, and then we can reach our aims. Otherwise, it's mm -hmm. just bureaucratic approach without good results. Thank you, Andy. Sorry for a bit interrupting you. Let's go to Alex on something specific on the values, and please be be shorter. We have like questions. Alex, your microphone. Yeah. Yes, yes, I have uh, un unmuted it. Um, so one uh, uh, one thing about values is to um, to basically um, uh, live up to our own uh, concepts, and that is that every country that is in Europe can become member of the European Union. So uh, some countries want to become members. So why not say so and open this, uh, this perspective to them? I'm talking about Ukraine, uh, of course, first and foremost, and of course, and as well, Georgia and, and Moldova. Um, yes, uh, their way may be uh, longer or shorter or, um, or um, you know, may involve some conditionality, but but um, uh, it, the their European perspective should be more openly uh, open to them. Um, well, in some countries where we are, uh, you can you can stop me if, if I Alex, talk too long. If I may stop you, because the okay, your idea good. was about Enough. this values and then and the membership as as a, one of the, the the reflection of the real value. Uh, let's go to Dmitri, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, I wouldn't agree that European Union uh, has some uh, problems with the values. As a union, I think our values are quite clear. Well, there are some uh, countries within uh, those countries, there are some, let's say, uh, nasty politicians and some political movements who might have some problems with their values. But in general, I think European Union uh, is very much clear about the values within the union and the values we are we are projecting uh, uh, to our neighbors. Yep. Thank you, Dmitry. Pavel. So uh, we speak for decades about freedom and freedoms, but uh, sometimes it seems we forget the word justice, uh, fairness, and uh, capitalism, because uh, freedom without capitalism is impossible. And uh, currently, um, Eastern neighborhood uh, of Europe uh, ha ha has a lot of problem with capitalism, as in Russia, as in Belarus, as in Ukraine, for instance, and so on. Thank you. That's all. I think this would be the right, since we have approximately 25 minutes left for our discussion, and I see they are already more than five questions from our participants. Let's go to the, the audience questions. And um, one of the first which came in and which I would like Pavel as the first actually to respond to, and then also other our participants to add is, what could be the first steps to start a conversation with Russia without making NATO seem weak? as very much Russia likes the language of power, not diplomacy. So that basically, let's talk a little bit about those engagement rules or the engagement framework with Russia. Oh, uh, it's a tricky, tricky question because um, I'm afraid that uh, without current domestic political circumstances, uh, circumstances of Russia, uh, it's um, impossible to achieve uh, some good results of any dialogue. So um, we have to wait uh, the transition of power in Russia. Maybe it, it will be in coming years, maybe it, it will be in coming decade 
or even later, but um, currently uh, it's impossible uh, to achieve something strategic. But uh, in uh, tactical issues like, um, uh, in, especially in defense area, especially in security, like for example, turning on transponders on aircrafts, for example, prevent some, um, I don't know, some uh, dangerous behavior in outer space. I mean, uh, uh, military satellites and uh, some other deals. Uh, for instance, um, long range uh, ground-based cruise missiles that are based uh, in Western military districts uh, of uh, Russia. Mm, and uh, first, of all, first of all, we have to uh, understand uh, whether or not uh, the START treaty uh, will be prolonged uh, and uh, for what prospect it uh, should be prolonged. Uh, many other uh, tactical issues. Thank you. Is there anybody who wants to add, please? Alex? Alex Anandis, yeah, Alex, go first, please. Uh, Russia has uh, a rich uh, and diverse uh, civil society. So uh, engaging Russia, I would suggest, would should uh, first and uh, foremost engage uh, civil society of Russia. Thank you. Andis. Not Kremlin. Andis? Yeah, thank you. If I'm not mistaken, the question was about NATO policy, how to NATO should so NATO could, react but to, to I think we can easily extend to EU as well. And EU as well, okay. I will say about shortly about both. Uh, I I think we we cannot uh, we we should not to demand much from NATO as an international player. The aim and goal of NATO is to protect their uh, member countries, and that's it. We cannot do something outside of NATO only if there is United Nations Security Council uh, decision, like in Afghanistan. And why it was successful? Because Russia, as a member of EU, um, NATO, uh, I'm sorry, United Nations uh, Security Council, Russia also was interested to have to do something in Afghanistan. So other places, I'm, I'm afraid we cannot do much. I, I really support Georgia and Ukraine as a members in future uh, of NATO. But on this moment, I mean, NATO cannot do something like special. NATO can say that fifth paragraph is in charge for all NATO countries. That's it. For the EU, I agree with Alex, yeah, the engagement with civil society is really important, of course. And to the officials, there is another type of language, is sanctions, and that's it. So EU, in those uh, Eastern Partnership countries, EU has to show muscles more than NATO. Thank you. Uh, and then we do have a question Actually, can we, res can we expect restart in relations with Russia in the, f in the near future? If, um, if each of you could quickly... Yep, please, Andis. I'm afraid reset is impossible because of character of Russian power in nowadays. So they, it's just impossible. We have to have strategic patience in relations with Russia. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Pavel? Yeah, I'm agree with uh, uh, Andis. Uh, I'm afraid no, because, you know, Kremlin does not respect European Union and uh, European countries, uh, leaders of European countries. Because uh, Kremlin respects, uh, for example, uh, power like Mr. Erdogan. Kremlin respects the United States and considers that uh, European Union uh, 
Washington is just a kind of uh, satellites of uh, United States. So um, currently, uh, Kremlin, uh, I'm afraid, is not ready to speak uh, with uh, Europeans uh, in equal manner. Thank you. Um, if there's nobody wants to add anything else on the restart, we have a next question. Where is one of the problems with the Eastern partnership is the lack of results. Uh, this is a little bit like the statement which we can agree on and which we can also disagree. I would love that um, the first who would, could volunteer to say and to bit evaluate the Eastern Partnership and say, haven't been there really a no results or there have been a results and what have been those results? If there's no volunteer, I will pick the, I will pick the speaker. <laughs> so, uh, Dmitri, I know you're smiling, you probably have some good answer. Well, uh, I don't know. Is it uh, is it is it a good answer or, or not? But I think uh, it's always about our perceptions of those results we uh, anticipated or we expected. And uh, in a good sense, of course, our uh, naivety uh, I think wasn't uh, paid enough uh, in terms of let's say such countries like uh, Moldova or or even Ukraine. But then again, uh, we should compare the situation, uh, not just, let's say, for uh, uh, last uh, four or five years, but on the longer term. And, you know, these cardinal changes within the societies, they really take time. And, uh, well, I think we should apply this strategic patient uh, and this thought uh, regarding Russia. I think we should be uh, equally patient uh, regarding uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and uh, maybe also Moldova, uh, because uh, again, uh, this change management uh, requires uh, a special mindset within the society across different uh, different groups. And if we would like to see deliveries just in a European bureaucratic matter, you know, ticking the boxes and approaching it with this. Uh, uh, European standards, uh, then I think we <laughs> we will be disappointed uh, each time we apply that. So again, I think it's a, it's a it's a two way traffic, and uh, uh, we need those countries to be on board and to introduce, let's say, the standards of good governance. But uh, I think it will be fool for us to expect quick results, knowing actually that uh, there is a malicious influence against these countries. I mean, we are not playing in a vacuum. We are not playing, let's say, in a box between the European Union and, uh, let's say, Ukraine or Moldova. Uh, there is also a, a third uh, party there, uh, the Kremlin or, let's say, other parties who interfere seriously. So they, uh, of course, use different gaps within the societies and they uh, explore uh, vulnerabilities and all of that, of course, uh, makes it uh, much more difficult, uh, complicated, and obviously slower. Yeah. Thank you. Um, on this, please. Uh, thank you. Just to add what Dmitri said, uh, of course, association agreements are success. Uh, bravo for citizens of Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine. This is success, especially if we look to the official Russia who had been lobbying many years uh, we, uh, free visa uh, regime between EU and Russia and didn't success and didn't receive it. So in that sense, those three countries got it. Uh, and uh, so it's yeah it, it's not super big but but still it is look to the freedom house nations in transit rank all the the best of course front runners are three baltic states and slovenia and for eastern partnership countries there is as already alex told there is no real prospect to become eu member countries why we were so successful in the 90s 
in the beginning of this century in, in democratic reforms in the Baltic states because we, we saw real option, real possibility to become full member of EU. So we have to think about carrot also when we think about how to engage those Eastern partnership countries. Thank you. Thank you, Andis. So, does anyone else wants to add to, to this question? Okay, then we go to next one, um, and it reads as towards joining the EU and the NATO. Like, is there a real aim for the Eastern partnership? Or it has become an illusion? I think here what the, 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 the representative of the audience means is more like talking about the Eastern Partnership or any other policy could replace EU membership and NATO membership. So that should we, shouldn't we actually focus more on the clearly cut EU membership, for instance, and then put aside other things and then, then strategically go for this EU? That that could boost the process better. What would be your comments, please? Alex, maybe you have some ideas on this. <laughs> well, um, the, and I'll start with success. You know, like uh, it's very much uh, how we describe success. You know, what, what is successful? And then we can measure uh, only then. Um, of, of course, uh, um, well, there are other, other ways of uh, possibly getting close to EU and NATO, uh, uh, which is short of membership. Uh, this spatial, special ally status is uh, that uh, that uh, Ukraine has, I think, special ally of the United States. I think that is, um, that is a very strong, um, um, strong status. Uh, and, um, and, and so there are all kinds of, of possible descriptions that, um, that can be a little short of, uh, of the actual thing, but uh, at the, the actual prospects should, all, should always be there. And I think the person who asked this question uh, meant, uh, aren't we replacing by talk and by this Eastern partnership something, uh, the, the actual prospect of joining in <clears throat> EU and, 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 uh, uh, and NATO. Um, and uh, I think that we should be very, uh, sort of very outspoken and careful in not substituting, in saying that this is a useful, um, <clears throat> useful uh, instrument for cooperating with these countries. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less useful. Uh, uh, but uh, but it does not uh, substitute the actual, uh, the real thing. And uh, and then it would not. Um, I don't think that it was meant to, to as a substitution. And I'm, I agree with Andes that, uh, especially uh, with Ukraine, the, uh, <clears throat> the association agreement is, is very, uh, very deep, very minute. Uh, it is very successful. It has opened trade with the European Union for Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is successfully Using uh, using these uh, trade uh, opportunities, uh, but we don't hear about that about it that much, you know. Like, um, so uh, it is successful, and uh, and it is not a substitute, especially if we don't see it as a substitute. Thank you, Alex, for very well putting it. Um, if there's no more willing to talk on this, we can go to the next question, because I think we are let, left with like 10 minutes and three questions. We'll, we will make it. Uh, and this question will go to Andis. So probably some of your students. So <laughs> um, how it's flexible, it's, and then it goes back about the values and flexibility and normativeness. 
how flexible can we be in our values when the conversation in the conversation with the eastern uh, neighbors of the in the east of Europe? To what can we close our eyes and to what we cannot? Where we can of where we can compromise and where we can't? On this, please. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good one. Uh, I think it's not like some two opposite elements. It's just we have to work in both in the same time. Uh, we, we have to keep in mind that our goal is democratic and free and prosperous and secure countries uh, in our neighborhood, of course. The question is how to get it, how to reach it. For example, this uh, normative policy toward Belarus didn't give success many years and only after Belarusians themselves start to believe that they can be free, they can change something, they, they are still on the streets and I highly support them. I hope there will be really good results of all those protests. So it's, it has to be both. We just do not, uh, uh, we, we cannot step our, uh, stop ourselves in engagement. If we see that those countries are with some lack of democracy, we can engage in different kind of uh, ways like people to people contacts and in, uh, also to promote uh, business uh, relations, etc. Just keep in mind that goals are the same, but the methods to engage are different. And it's not something uh, which uh, goes in opposite, like in the wrong run, long run. Thank you. Thank you, Andis. Um, is anyone willing to add something? Alex, did you raise a hand or? We don't Thinking hear you. About, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear you, me now? Well, um, I lived and worked in a country that is uh, very much an epitome of a European um, um, uh, realistic approach, and that is Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has been very important for Europe and also for the United States uh, as 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 the uh, the the country uh, uh, through which uh, the uh, gas and oil from Central Asia and from Azerbaijan itself was going to uh, to Georgia and 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 further to to, to Turkey and to Southern Europe <clears throat> and and Europe in general and the West in general. So in that sense, Azerbaijan has been very, very important. Azerbaijan is an authoritarian state. It pretends not very successfully to be a democracy. Uh, um, it, it, it sort of, uh, it tries to buy uh, various politicians uh, in Western Europe <clears throat> to go there to sort of to eat the black caviar and to sort of and to announce that they have never seen a better democracy than Azerbaijan, but because of the of, of the importance, um, the sort of the criticism of the country has really been muted, if 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 even if it existed, there are scandals from time to time, but um, but but it's still. Um, has it uh, has it been working? I doubt it. Is Azerbaijan extremely important? It is. It was also important for the United States as a hub on the way to Afghanistan at the time when uh, when the United States was delivering uh, troops uh, and and materials to Afghanistan, and later when it was withdrawing troops and materials uh, from uh, from Afghanistan. Um, so, um, so that is that is uh, another, in addition to Belarus, a very important, important, uh, important example. I would also sort of say, uh, and, and maybe it's not really connected, that I think the European Union and um, and the OSC, but but the European Union mostly has not put enough effort into uh, resolving the Karabakh uh, conflict. And now it has been resolved in a in an extremely unsuccessful manner. 
um, and, and, and dangerous manner involving new conflicts in the future. Um, so I, I think that if, had, if there was uh, this re real politic uh, approach to, uh, to um, Azerbaijan, well, it should have somehow um, uh, extended uh, uh, in peacemaking uh, efforts to, uh, towards um, the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. If it had been, the uh, European Union would have had a better rating in Azerbaijan with the population and with its leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Well, let's let's go to the next question. And as I as I like to say, there is no hour without a COVID. And also, we have a question about, and a very good question, I think, if the COVID crisis can improve or impair the future democratization process and in general development of the Eastern Partnership and the relationship between the Eastern Partnership and the EU. So, um, Pavel, please. Yeah, uh, um, uh, this question, <laughs> I'm afraid, is not about democratization because uh, during this pandemic, uh, we see the cost of uh, new totalitarianism, not only in China or in authoritarian states, but also uh, in European states. Uh, in Israel, yeah, where um, governments, uh, national governments, uh, uh, just want to uh, preserve themselves, uh, want to keep their power, want to keep their political um, position, uh, positions, and uh, they uh, announce lockdowns, uh, by lockdowns, and so on, and so on. It's, uh, I'm afraid it's not about democracy. Uh, it's, it's, it's about a new edition of uh, um, totalitarianism, uh, maybe digital total, total, totalitarianism and so on and so on. Uh, and also uh, the so-called success of China in struggling with uh, COVID um, may be very attractive for many other states uh, in this world. Uh, so, um, it's it's illusion that uh, COVID crisis uh, will lead us uh, to further democratization. It, it, it is much more probable that it will lead us to uh, other authoritarian uh, trend or totalitarian trend. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Pavel. Uh, is probably there is somebody who could have, if not entirely opposite opinion, but then also some other positive side effects what the COVID crisis has, has, has done in the Eastern partnership in our, in our Eastern neighborhood. Like, because there are thoughts that, for instance, uh, in case of the Belarus, actually, that was something which also fueled the civic activism. Yeah, please, Dmitry. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Belarus, although, of course, my minds are totally with the democratic people of that republic. But uh, again, uh, about Ukraine, uh, I think uh, that crisis, again, combined with the unfortunate and high incompetence of uh, Ukrainian government exposed a lot of uh, vulnerabilities within Ukrainian society and a lot of, again, uh, bad practices of governance. And uh, knowing a little bit uh, Ukrainian, I think that could be, again, a good uh, push for them. So they uh, understood, basically, uh, that uh, their expectations and unfulfilled uh, uh, dreams about the current government uh, will already uh, about to end. And uh, since it's, again, functional democracy, not in a way we... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we wish to be, but still, uh, I think they will uh, change that uh, uh, ruling elite uh, very quickly, and that might be uh, for good. Or at least I, I still still maintain that optimism that you know explored uh, and evident gaps because of the crisis and combined with this incompetence of Zelensky team 
might be uh, might be for good for uh, Ukrainian society. Thank you. Is there if there's no other thoughts to put on top of all what we talked today, I see that our time is also over. First of all, thank you, thank you so much to all four of our brilliant speakers, to all the capitals and places you are right now. And also um, apologize to those questions which couldn't, couldn't make because the one hour is, is, is the maximum what we have today. I know that the, our new leaders group has a lot of other engagements today and tomorrow. So uh, 